Okay, hello everyone. I am back for a second reading today for a train book called Steam, Smoke, and Steel, Back in Time with Trains. And this book's by Patrick O'Brien, so I want to thank the train master for inviting me back to read another book. So when I grow up, I want to drive a train just like my dad does. I think my dad's got the best job in the world. He's an engineer. Up in the cab of his giant locomotive, he controls 10,000 tons of rolling steel. Coal, oil, lumber, cars, whatever needs to be carried by rail, he hauls it with his 4,400 horsepower diesel engine. One day, I counted more than 100 freight cars lined up behind his engine. That train was more than a mile long. Have you ever noticed that there's usually more than one engine pulling a train? When the locomotives are joined up like that, it's called a consist. The engines working together can pull really heavy loads. My dad controls all the engines in his consist from his seat in the front of the first locomotive. Computer controls in the cab help drive the train, but my dad does a lot of the driving with hand controls. To start the train, my father releases the brake and moves the reverser to the forward setting. Then he uses the throttle to set the speed. The throttle has eight speeds from run one up to run eight. He begins slowly at run one, and when he gets to run eight, he goes 70 miles per hour. His train thunders down the track like my grandfather's train did 30 years before. When my dad was a kid in the 1960s, he sometimes got to ride on his dad's train. My grandfather's locomotive was smaller and had less pulling power than my dad's, but it worked the same way. The diesel engines turned electric generators. The generators made electricity, and the electricity turned the wheels to make the train go. That's why diesel locomotives are sometimes called diesel electric locomotives. My dad loves to tell me stories about riding with his father in the cab of that old diesel. I'll never forget the time, he'll say, when my dad let me ride with him all the way up from Florida. We were hauling a circus train. You should have seen it when we stopped in those little towns along the way. The elephants were let out and your granddaddy and I took them for a walk down the street. The clowns and acrobats would come out and start doing a show just for the fun of it. I tell you, those folks in those towns had never seen anything like it. But my grandfather tells different stories. When he was still a kid, trains ran on steam power instead of diesel. The locomotives were like great big smoking puffing monsters. My grandfather says he'll al he always wanted to drive one of those old steam locomotives like his mom did back in the old days. It was very unusual to find a woman engineer in the 1930s, but they say my great grandmother was an unusual woman. My grandfather still remembers the puffing smoke, hissing steam and his mom smiling and waving as her train pulled into the station. My great-grandmother drove a steam locomotive. The diesel electric locomotive had just been invented, but she didn't like the brand new diesels that, that she began seeing around the train yard. Yes, they were shiny and modern, but she was a romantic. She loved the billowing steam and smoke, the big driving wheels, and the red hot firebox of her dad's old steam engine. Somehow those new diesels just didn't have as much charm as the classic steamers. The old steam engines were not as efficient as the newer diesels though. A steam engine had to stop about every hundred miles to fill up on coal and water. It made a lot of thick black smoke that clogged up the air in the cities and was also really noisy. A diesel did not have to stop as often to fill up on fuel, and it was quieter and cleaner than a steam engine. 
From the 1930s to the 1950s, almost all the railroads in the country replaced their old steam locomotives with diesel. A lot of locomotives from my great-grandmother's time were designed with smooth curves and flowing lines. This was called streamlining, and it was supposed to make the train look faster and more modern. Some people said that the streamliners looked like they were going fast even when they were standing still. There were lots of different steam liners. Some were diesel and some were steam. Underneath the smooth surfaces though, my great grandmother's locomotive was a lot like the one that her father had driven years before. My great great grandfather drove a train in the 1900s. When his daughter first saw that train, she knew just what she wanted to do when she grew up. She wanted to be an engineer and drive a train like her dad. My great-great-grandfather started working on trains as a fireman. A fireman on the train didn't put, a fire, put out a fire, he kept it going. He rode in the cab with the engineer and shoveled coal from the tender into the fire in the firebox. In a steam engine, coal or wood was burned in the firebox to heat the water in the huge boiler. This made lots and lots of steam, and the steam was used as power to make the train run. A fireman's job was tough, hot, and dirty. He had to keep the fire burning at just the right heat. He also had to keep up a steady pace with his shoveling. If he slowed down, so did the train. In his years as a fireman, my great-great-grandfather shoveled tons and tons of coal. Somehow, he found time to keep an eye on the engineer beside him, and he learned how to drive the mighty locomotive. Finally, he became an engineer, just like his father had been years before. My great-great-grandfather grew up in the days of the classic American-type steam locomotive. His dad, my great-great-great-grandfather, drove one in the 1870s. This is an American-type locomotive. This train was built for crossing the wide open spaces of the young United States. My great-great-great-grandfather liked to tell stories, too. His favorite was about the time his train was held up by the famous outlaw Jesse James. James and his gang had piled a bunch of logs on the tracks to force the train to stop. The bandits had their six shooters out, and they made the passengers get out of the train and hand over all of their money. Everyone was really scared, but my great-great-great-grandfather made sure that no one got hurt. In those days, there were several brakemen on the train. There was no brake for the whole train. Each car had its own. When the train needed to stop or slow down, the brakemen had to run along the tops of the cars and turn the wheel of the handbrake on each car. This was a very dangerous job, especially on cold, snowy days. But in the late 1870s, an air brake was developed so the engineer could stop the train by himself with a lever up in his cab. My great-great-great-great-grandfather drove a train in the 1850s, in the early days of railroads. The ride was slow and bumpy, but his son loved to go along any time he could. Railroad companies were being started all along the east coast of the United States in the 1850s. The railroads laid tracks between the big cities in the east and began spreading west towards the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. It wasn't easy to lay out a railroad, especially over land with lots of rivers, hills, and mountains. A train can't go up a steep hill and it can't go around a sharp curve, so the tracks had to be made as flat and straight as possible. The railroad workers built bridges over valleys and drilled tunnels through mountains. It took a lot of time and money, but it was worth it. With the railroads in place, people could travel a lot faster and a lot further, 
and things like coal, cattle, and other heavy stuff could be shipped over long distances. My great, 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 great grandfather was proud to be a part of it since his father had helped to get it all started. In the 1830s, my great, 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 great grandfather sometimes rode along with his dad on one of the first trains in the United States. My great, 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 great grandfather liked to brag that he was one of the very first people ever to drive a train in this country. Before trains, people traveled in stagecoaches and buggies. People had never traveled faster than the speed of a running horse, and at first they weren't too sure about this brand new invention called a steam locomotive. One time my great, 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 great grandfather decided to prove that this machine could go faster and pull more weight than a horse ever could. He set up a race. His locomotive, pulling three cars and 20 people, against a horse and carriage with three people inside. He gave the horse a small head start and then set off down the rails. Smoke came pouring out of the smokestack of the little engine and the passengers were choked with black smoke and showered up with burning embers. Ladies put up their umbrellas for protection, but they had to throw them out the windows when they started to catch on fire. People were amazed that the train could actually go almost 20 miles per hour. After 10 miles, the train crossed the finish line a mile ahead of the horse. The horse was all tired out, but the locomotive was puffing away, ready to go another 10 miles. The passengers' clothes were ruined by the rains of spark, but they could all see that trains were the way of the future. So I guess you could say that trains run in my family. My father, my grandfather, my great-grandmother, my great-great, well, you get the idea. They all drove trains. When I'm a grown-up, I want to drive a train too. And maybe then I'll have a kid of my own. And these are the trains in the book that were featured. Well, there you go, Railroad fans. There's another reading of a train book, Steam, Smoke, and Steel. Please join the YouTube channel for the Train Master. Have a good day.